Fifty years ago, on January 27, 1967, a flash fire during launch rehearsal of Apollo 1 killed astronauts Gus Grissom, Roger Chafee, and Ed White. They were scheduled for the program's first test flight a few weeks later on February 21st. Up next on American History TV's Real America, a half-hour CBS News special report, originally broadcast at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, just a few hours after the 6.30 p.m. disaster. An investigation later determined that the astronauts died in seconds from asphyxiation and that the fire was electrical and spread rapidly due to excessive combustible material and the pure oxygen environment inside the cabin. It was also determined that the capsule door design made rescue very difficult and that crew escape had not been adequately considered. This is a CBS News special report. This is Mike Wallace at the CBS Newsroom in New York. America's first three Apollo astronauts were trapped and killed by a flash fire that swept their moonship early tonight during a launch pad test at Cape Kennedy in Florida. Virgil Gus Grissom, 40 years old, one of the original Mercury astronauts, the first American astronaut to go twice into space. Edward White, 36 years old, the first American to walk in space. And rookie astronaut Roger Chaffee, 31 years old, training for his first space flight, Apollo 1, scheduled for February 21st. These three astronauts were aboard their spaceship 10 minutes from a simulated liftoff at Cape Kennedy when the fire hit at about 6.30 tonight. They were inside their spaceship, pressurized, buttoned up inside their spacesuits when the fire hit. A closed-circuit television camera was relaying pictures of the astronauts lying on their backs inside the spacecraft to top the two-stage Saturn I. There was a flash, and that was it, according to a NASA spokesman watching the television screen in the blockhouse a few hundred yards away from launch pad 34. The screen went blank, and he said there was no communication from the astronauts. They died silently and apparently swiftly. Their bodies have been left in the spacecraft, according to the latest information from the Cape, pending an investigation into the disaster. President Johnson tonight mourned the death of the three astronauts. He said they gave their lives in the nation's service. Our brave men in uniform, whether in Vietnam or seeking the frontiers of the future, he said, mourn with all of us the tragic loss of three gallant and dedicated airmen. This film was shot about 10 days ago down at Cape Kennedy at the time of another test for the Apollo spacecraft and the Saturn I rocket. Roger Chaffee, the rookie astronaut, there are the three of them, Gus Grissom on the left, Ed White in the middle, and Roger Chaffee. Grissom, 40 years old, the father of teen, two teenage boys, one of the original Mercury astronauts, this is Ed White, and this Roger Chaffee, a lieutenant in the United States Navy, 31 years old, preparing for his first space flight. He was the rookie in the crew, Chaffee, born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He was like Gus Grissom, an engineering graduate of Purdue University, the father of two small children. Ed White, 36 years old, the father of two children, born of a military family in San Antonio, Texas, a graduate of West Point, and Gus Grissom from Indiana, a graduate of Purdue University. With me here in the CBS Newsroom is Robert Wessler, who is the executive editor of the CBS News Space Unit. Bob, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about the rocket and the spacecraft. Certainly, Mike. This is a Saturn 1B rocket, uh, also referred to as an uprated Saturn rocket. This lower portion, I'll separate them here for you. Uh, this is the launch vehicle, first stage, second stage. Incidentally, this is not the vehicle that eventually will take U.S. astronauts to the moon. This is a, an interim rocket that we'll be using for the next couple of flights. Now, what I have in my hand now uh, is the, where the accident occurred this afternoon. This is the launch escape tower, which <clears throat> if this had happened uh, on a launch day prior to flight, uh, an abort such as uh, that occurred today, the thought here would have been that the launch escape tower would have taken the spacecraft, this is the command module where the three action, uh, uh, astronauts actually fly, would have taken them safely away from any blow-ups. However, the type of accident that occurred today, this was an internal fire 
in here caused by oxygen, which we'll talk about in a second. May we look at the larger Certainly. model over here, right. Bob? This is the same thing that we've been talking about. Again, the launch escape tower, and this is a larger, about three times si the size mock-up that we have here. Now, this is the command module. This is where the a astronauts were today. This is the service module. This is where the fuels and the electrical systems are, uh, are housed, are engineered in here. Uh, the spacecraft today was in a fully pressurized system. This means 100% oxygen. The speculation tonight, and again, I must say it's speculation only, is that there was some electrical problem, uh, possibly with some plastic wires or something of that nature, but this is speculation purely, uh, that, an, uh, that an electrical short circuit occurred, and of course, I think everyone knows what would happen in the event of an electrical short circuit in a 100% oxygen state. That's our speculation as of the moment, Mike. The three men were to have gone up on February 21st for a 14-day upwards. Orbital. That's right, Mike. Upwards of two weeks. Uh, our guess was that it was going to be a 10 or an 11-day flight, but they were scheduled for a two-week flight. And the latest news from Cape Kennedy and from the Houston Manned Spacecraft Center is that the flight of Apollo 1 has now been postponed indefinitely. The hallmark of America's space program since the first Mercury launch as all of us Americans know, has been its openness, a conscientious effort on the part of NASA to let the American people share in this incredible adventure. And so, among the regular preparations for each new space flight, beginning with Mercury through all of the Gemini series, and now with this one, Apollo, Apollo 1, there have been a series of advance interviews with the astronauts involved. A few weeks ago, down at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee sat down with CBS News correspondent Nelson Benton, and they talked about the mission which ended in flames on Pad 34 tonight. We begin with Gus Grissom's description of the Apollo spacecraft. Itself with, uh, again, with our reaction control nozzles here, with our steam vent lines and, and a lot of electronics and things around the outside. Now, as I lift this part of the structure here, we can see... Uh, the interior, you can see the three of us in our positions. I'm on the left side, Ed White in the center, and Roger Chaffee on the right. Now, down below each of these two outer stations are our sleep stations. And uh, then the seats will actually move forward a little bit, and it gives us a lot of standing room down in this area here. Now, the area you're looking at right here is the uh, navigation station, the uh, sextant and telescope are down there, and the uh, computer and the basic guidance and navigation is down in that area. Now, if you can look up into this area, you'll see this is our main instrument panel. And most of the systems and their monitoring instruments are from about this point over. And Roger has, uh, has those to watch during launch. And, and this, this station is our primary watch station during orbit. We have normally always have a man in the station. Again, some of this intersection here is taken up with guidance and navigation uh, instruments and, and facilities for Ed. And then the left side is the primary flight station where the uh, our uh, attitude gyro is, our eight ball, and, and uh, all of the uh, instruments and switches to make uh, our SPS burns. Well, spacecraft can be flown, actually flown from all three pilot positions. Uh, yes, as far as the flight controls themselves are concerned, the, the stick that flies it, uh, it's movable. We can move it from the left station to the center station to the right station or even down to lower equipment bay if we need to. And we have two of them on board also. Well, that's a sort of a quick tour, but uh, about as good as this model allows, I guess. You flew on, on Mercury, you flew on Gemini, now you're flying on, uh, on Apollo. Does the law of averages, so far as the possibility of a catastrophic failure, bother you at all, sir? No, you sort of have to put that out of your mind. And, there's always a possibility that uh, uh, you can have a catastrophic failure, of course. This can happen on any flight. It can happen on the, on the last one as well as the first one. So uh, you just plan as best you can to take care of uh, all of these eventualities. And uh, you get a well-trained crew and you go fly. You're busy enough. The spacecraft you're going to ride on is, a, to a certain extent, untried. You're taking a shakedown cruise. You approach it with any uh, apprehension as compared to the Gemini, which had been flown before? No, I don't think so. I think you have to understand the feeling that a 
pilot has and that a test pilot has that I, I look forward a great deal to, uh, to the first flight. There's a great deal of uh, pride involved in making a first flight. So I think I'm, I'm looking forward to the flight with a great deal of anticipation. Is there anything uh, scary about a first sp space flight, even though you've flown many hours in conventional aircraft, jet aircraft? Oh, I don't like to say anything scary about it. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns, of course, and a lot of problems that could develop or might develop, and they'll have to be solved. And that's what we're there for. This is our business, to find out if this thing will work for us. Uh, I don't think it'll be uh, probably a whole lot worse than a guy that's making a first test flight on a new airplane. Now, I've never done that, so I don't know. I think everybody feels a little apprehensive uh, when they count down. I don't see how you could help but be a little bit excited. But I don't think anybody is, uh, you know, I, I don't like to use the word scary. I, I definitely think you're apprehensive and you're considering what's involved there. You're thinking about it. But you know how to handle it and take care of it and do the job. The flight that you're about to take is another step toward the moon. Could you philosophize on just why you think uh, we should go to the moon? I think there's so many questions, so many reasons why we should. Uh, I guess some of my special reasons I'll, I'll give to you. I think one of the ones that, I, that a lot of people forget about is uh, the influence that the lunar program has on our raising of our young people in the country. I think our most prime responsibility is to provide a environment so that our children be, will be able to grow up into uh, creative, useful, and good citizens. And I think that the space program, more so than anything we've done in the past, has given a stimulus to the young people and the, the very young children even, and in a, in a goal for them and a purpose for them to educate themselves as well as they can to their own capability and to have even though they're not going to be obviously all become astronauts, but they, if they start out with, with a certain goal when they're young and the goal is properly directed, these young people, I think, have a much more of a chance of becoming uh, useful and uh, well-educated citizens who will take care of you and I when we get older and we don't have the capability to, to direct the world. The young people will run our world for us when we get older. I guess this is a one of the things that I feel the most strongly about. But I also feel that, uh, and this is from just a standpoint of man, I, I think that if a civilization, and I think if our country becomes so obsessed with making the, the country uh, easy for us to live in and making our surroundings so comfortable that, uh, that we're in a really a ever descending, spiraling in spiral, right within ourselves. And if we don't look out, and if we don't try to expand ourselves and expand our horizons, which I think the space program is the biggest example of expanding your horizons that man has ever undertaken, we're not going to progress as a nation. And probably the, the more practical viewpoint, I think that it provides a uh, great opportunity for just plain stimulating our industry which feeds right back into making the comfort items that go back into making living good, too. So I think it, from all standpoints, it's a good program. And why we want to go to the moon specifically, well, it's the closest thing that we haven't explored to our Earth, and it's the first step into understanding the, the whole universe. Astronaut Ed White, the first American to walk in space aboard that famed flight during the Gemini series with his command pilot, Jim McDivitt. At 10.30 tonight Eastern Time, rescue teams began to remove the bodies of the three astronauts from the charred spacecraft, perched 200 feet above launch pad 34. A NASA spokesman said the dead astronauts were left in the ship for four hours to aid the investigation into the tragedy. As I said, two of the three astronauts who died tonight aboard the Apollo had already flown in space. Both made history. On June 3rd, 1965, the man that you've just been listening to, Ed White, 
climbed out of the hatch of Gemini 4, and he became the first American to ride through the frozen vacuum of space, clad only in a space suit. Here is that historic flight described by Ed White himself. This is actually, it looks like the egress. This is actually when I'm coming out. What I had tried to do was actually fly, to actually fly with the gun or maneuver with the gun right out of the spacecraft. And when I departed the spacecraft this time, there was no push off whatsoever from the spacecraft. The gun actually provided the impulse for me to leave the spacecraft. The first time I tried to come out, there I go. All right now I'm, I'm leaving and it's under the influence of the gun. I'm trying to maneuver over to my left so I would be in front of Jim's window. I maneuvered approximately down the center line of the spacecraft, perhaps favoring just a little on the right. But the gun is actually providing the impulse for my maneuvers. Right now I'm actually uh, working with the tether only. I'm not working with the gun. It ran out after my first, uh, my actually second translation out in front of the spacecraft and back. And this was the time I had made the statement, I sure wish I had a little bit more uh, fuel for my gun. It was pretty interesting though, uh, I, I didn't mind getting back on the adapter uh, section. I was able to actually take a look at the thruster areas. The plumes of the thrusters as Jim was firing them to stabilize the spacecraft looked just the way uh, uh, Mr. Chamberlain told me they would. Look, they came out about a foot and a half or two feet from the spacecraft and uh, didn't look very ominous at all. This area, the foot and a half to two feet was a area in which the heat, they felt the heat would damage my suit. I was right above him, about five or six feet above him, watching him fire at one time. Here we go, Mark. <laughs> that was Ed White, one of the three astronauts who died aboard the Apollo spacecraft on launch pad 34 early tonight at Cape Kennedy. The astronauts apparently died instantly. Space officials said that a gantry wrapped around the booster rocket prevented the use of the Apollo's emergency escape system which would have been this up here at the top, the rocket that would have taken the spacecraft away from the rocket, so that the only way that the astronauts could have escaped would have been to open the hatches here in their spacecraft and scramble out, and that simply was impossible. The space officials say that the three astronauts possibly had no knowledge that there was a serious problem. The spacecraft and rocket were not fueled. Explosive devices aboard the spacecraft had been inactivated, and they could not have caused the disaster. Minor difficulties had cropped up during the countdown this afternoon with two systems, the communication system and the environmental control system, and the space officials say that they don't know whether the fire stemmed from the two troublesome systems, the fire that engulfed the spacecraft and caused the death of the three astronauts. The man who was to command this doomed Apollo flight was known as the hard luck astronaut because of what was until tonight the closest brush with death of America's space program. Gus Grissom flew the second Mercury flight five years ago. It was just an up and down ride aboard a Redstone rocket. You see him here going aboard. It seemed perfect until splashdown. Walter Cronkite describes what happened. The hatch blew off, water poured in, and the capsule began to sink. A Navy helicopter hooked on, but was nearly dragged down as the capsule filled with seawater. Finally, another helicopter plucked Grissom from the water, soaking wet, unhurt, and very surprised. I was just laying there minding my own business, and then pow! The hatch went, I looked up, and I saw nothing but blue sky and water starting to come in over the sill. So I popped my helmet off, and the only two moves I remember making was tossing my helmet off and grabbing the uh, instrument panel and pulling myself out. I only remember grabbing the instrument panel. I don't even remember going out the door. The latest news from NASA about the accident on pad 34 that caused the death of the three astronauts. The pad safety crew was onto the pad and up to the tower about 10 to 15 minutes after the first indication of trouble late this afternoon. The flash fire occurred at 6.31 Eastern Standard Time. The smoke at that point, though, was so intense that the rescue crew wearing masks suffered smoke inhalation in spite of the masks. There were 27 men at the pad 
25 of the men suffered bad smoke inhalation, but evidently they're all right. Two are still under observation. Three doctors in the blockhouse dashed up as soon as conditions allowed, but by then it was too late to save the crew. For late information from Washington, Washington reaction to what happened at Cape Kennedy, we go now to our CBS News studios in Washington and correspondents Dave Shoemacher and Dan Rather. Mike, four astronauts are in seclusion in a hotel room just a few blocks from where I'm sitting. The four are Gordon Cooper, Dick Gordon, Neil Armstrong, and Jim Lovell. Gordo says, we just don't feel up to talking for television, but uh, he did uh, consent to a very short interview from his room. Cooper and the others are very shocked, as uh, Gordon put it, three of these men were our very closest friends. The astronauts, of course, are a closely knit group, and uh, they feel this quite deeply. Uh, but while the astronauts are upset, it would not be fair to say uh, that uh, they're brokenhearted over this. Uh, that's not the right word either. But as test pilots, as uh, astronauts, they were well aware of the dangers involved in this. And they seem most concerned tonight with the finding out of just what went wrong. Uh, as Cooper said, we're extremely anxious. We want to find out what caused it. Uh, the astronauts have been going over it, over and over it, one of the astronauts said, ever since uh, they first received that phone call. And since, the, uh, since then, the phone in their room has been ringing constantly as information comes to them, both from Cape Kennedy and from the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. Uh, Gordo says they still don't know enough about it to know really what happened. Uh, they do know that it happened during that countdown just a few seconds prior to the simulated liftoff. Uh, Cooper tended to doubt that it was in the environmental control system, although he said that there had been trouble with it earlier in this count and earlier with it in the uh, Apollo program. Uh, however, he seemed to feel that that had been licked. There also has been a history of electrical problems in the Apollo spacecraft. I asked Cooper if that had been cleared up, and he gave a rather short, bitter laugh before he said, well, we thought so. Cooper also admitted that it could be the electrical system, but he said that that would be a conjecture tonight. Cooper had visited the astronauts, Grissom, White, and Chaffee, just the other day down at Cape Kennedy. He said Gus was quite pleased with the spacecraft. All of the astronauts were excited about it. They thought they had everything under control. And then finally, uh, the last words that uh, Gordon Cooper and the others said, we want to make it clear that we want to forge ahead. As for the space program, they said we've got to be sure now that we don't stall it out just because of this. Also in town today were a number of the important officials of the space program, and Dan Rather tracked down several of them. Thank you, Dave. The Apollo dinner at the International Club here in Washington was held shortly after the signing of the Outer Space Treaty at the White House this afternoon. All of the top space officials were present at, for this Apollo dinner this evening at the International Club. Uh, present also were some business people involved in the space project. In fact, you might say it really was a a blue ribbon group of space officials, business and industry people gathered at the International Club for what was to have been a, a rather gala occasion. Some congressmen and some senators were present. Vice President Hubert Humphrey was there when I arrived, which was about an hour after the tragic message came from Cape Kennedy. It was not clear whether Vice President Humphrey had been at the Apollo dinner before or he had, whether he had come over after the word was received. The impression I gathered was that the Vice President had come to the dinner uh, after receiving word of the accident at Cape Kennedy. President Johnson telephoned the group at the Apollo dinner and talked with uh, Mr. James Webb, the director of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The whole dinner was sealed off to reporters and people from the outside for better than an hour. And one of the things that was decided in there, according to Mr. Webb, with whom we talked later, was that there wouldn't be any statement made tonight uh, by him, uh, no further statement from President Johnson, no statement from Vice President Humphrey. As he put it, we're all members of the team. We want to find out exactly what happened. We want to make sure the American people have the correct facts and all of the facts, but we simply have very few facts at the moment. Vice President Humphrey, as he came out of the building, uh, uh, was sad-faced. He told me personally, uh, I think President Johnson's statement speaks for the entire country. Um, as Mike reported earlier, President Johnson's official statement from the White House was, and I quote, three valiant young men have given their lives in national service and we mourn the great loss, and our hearts go out to their families, unquote the president. And Vice President Humphrey echoed those sentiments. 
As the Apollo meeting broke up, uh, everyone in the room seemed quite anxious to leave the room. Uh, some of those there didn't seem quite know how to act. Uh, a few simply shrugged their shoulders and said, what can you say? Others sought us out, that is, sought we reporters out to say, the one thing we want you to make clear is that no one in this program wants to give up or take a backward step. Werner von Braun, one of the better names, better known names in the American space program was there. And at first, uh, Werner von Braun wouldn't say anything at all. He kept saying, well, I'm a member of the team and I can't say anything. We're not supposed to say anything. But then finally, he, it seemed he just couldn't contain himself and he did start to talk to us a bit. He wouldn't come over to the studio and give anything approaching a, a full interview. What he said was, oh, the one thing that sticks out in my mind is he said all of the astronauts live on a first name basis with death. These men know the risks. They thought the risks were worth taking. Now he also said that, and I, Mike, I don't know whether this has been covered earlier, uh, and this is a direct quote from Werner von Braun, all we know is that there was a test going on at Cape Kennedy with the three astrono astronauts in the spacecraft under pure oxygen conditions, and the men probably died from asphyxiation because, and this continues the direct quote from Werner von Braun, after the fire broke out in the space capsule, they couldn't be evacuated in time. All of the oxygen burned up. This is Dan Rather with David Schumacher in Washington. Now back to Mike Wallace in New York. And according to the latest information from NASA at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, the first Apollo flight, which was scheduled for February the 21st, has now been postponed indefinitely. However, Walter Schirra, one of the original Mercury astronauts is command pilot on the backup crew, which also includes astronaut Don Isley and Walter Cunningham, both of them rookie astronauts. There is a spacecraft at North American Aviation out at Downey, California, which will take over the job of the damaged Apollo spacecraft, but that should take perhaps a month and a half for qualifying tests for that spaceship, and then perhaps another month and a half of simulated tests down at Cape Kennedy, so chances are it will be three months before Apollo 1 gets off the ground. Again, that is speculation. John Glenn, of course, is one of the best known names in the American space program, now out of it as a, as a working astronaut. Some months ago, astronaut John Glenn was asked whether space is safe. Oh, quite the opposite. Uh, I, th I think we all expect to lose a man sometime. We're working just as hard as we can work against it, of course. But in anything where you have equipment like this as high speed and as uh, on new equipment like this, we're not fighting our head in the sand. We're well aware somebody will get knocked off one of these days on some mission or other. But just as in aviation, we've all had many of our friends killed in aviation. This doesn't mean that uh, aviation progress stops and that we all go back and say we shouldn't fly anymore. If this program is worth running, why, there will be times when people will probably get hurt. But uh, the program will go on, and we're not going to stop our efforts. Meanwhile, we want to make it just as safe as we can possibly make it. John Glenn, flanked by the late Gus Grissom and by Deke Slayton of the space program. Another veteran of the United States space program is CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite, who has just arrived at our newsroom here in New York. Walter, I'm sure that this hits you particularly hard because these men were friends of yours. You knew Gus Grissom from the beginning down at Cape Kennedy. Yes, indeed, uh, Mike. That, that's, of course, true, and it does hit me hard. It's got to hit everybody hard, every American hard, for that matter, no matter how well you knew these men personally or not. I noticed uh, through the evening we've referred to Gus Grissom was the hard luck guy because of what happened to him in that second uh, suborbital Mercury flight when his uh, capsule went down. But you know, Gus said to me, uh, and he took, he took some umbrage at this being called the hard luck guy. No pilot, uh, certainly no astronaut, wants to have that uh, appellation laid against his name. And he said to me once, he said, you know, I'm not the hard luck guy. I'm the good luck guy. Uh, I'm the guy who came out of the capsule that sank in the in the ocean. Uh, and this was his attitude toward this whole matter, I think, of the space program. I'd like to comment, if I may, very quickly, Mike, without taking too much time, on a couple of things that have been mentioned uh, in the reports in this last uh, five hours since we knew of the tragedy. The uh, matter of an escape tower, uh, from what I have heard, and I've been talking to the Cape in these 
last uh, several minutes uh, to several of my friends down there. And uh, from what I gather, this wouldn't have helped a bit. If the escape tower had been rigged, and there is no evidence that it was and probably was not, the escape tower works on pyrotechnics, uh, on, on a blast of its own, on its rockets, and those rockets aren't placed in there this early in the countdown, I do not believe. I'm not sure about the Saturn program, but I don't think so. Uh, and even if it had been, even if the uh, gantry, the, the erector, had not been around the spacecraft to prevent it, apparently from all of the evidence from the crews that have been up there and looked into that tragedy-laden spacecraft, uh, these men could not have escaped anyway. Apparently they died absolutely instantly, uh, which points to this uh, most frequently mentioned speculation of an oxygen fire. And uh, we all can understand, uh, I think, oxygen the ox danger of oxygen, even if we don't know how fast it works, uh, because probably few of us who have not had the experience of going to a hospital and seeing a friend under an oxygen tent with all of those red signs warning against smoking. Any sort of a spark, uh, it's, it's a highly volatile thing, pure oxygen, and uh, apparently from the early evidence from the capsule, uh, it, it went and it went fast. These men were breathing pure oxygen. They, they in a sense, were part of this immediate momentary by the second disaster, millisecond disaster. And uh, if there is anything that can be rationalized about their deaths, it undoubtedly was instantaneous. Uh, these were smart test pilots. Their reaction times are amazingly fast, and they would have been on that horn calling back into the tower, even to report if they'd known they were about to go. They would have reported what it was so that the rest of the program would know. That's the kind of men they were. Uh, I think that I think one thing should be said. It's this is a time for great sadness, national sadness, and certainly the personal sadness of the people in the space program. But it's also a time for courage. And if that sounds trite, I'll change the words to guts. Uh, the thing that these fellows said on the film you showed earlier, the thing that everybody in the space program has been saying tonight and has been quoted uh, from Webb on down, that. This is a test program. We knew it was a test program, and these guys who went into it knew it was a test program. And a test program with equipment of this nature, as with airplanes or boats or submarines or anything where you're operating in a hostile environment, which space is, and this was a hostile environment even if they were on the ground because of this pure oxygen and all the rest of these things. This, this program is bound to claim its victims. These fellows, every one of them, were test pilots. They've been at Patuxent, uh, the Navy test station, Edwards Air Base, the Air Force uh, test station. They've flown highly sophisticated aircraft, and they've seen a lot of their buddies go down. And I don't know, I couldn't begin to tell you, because I don't know, I have the slightest idea of the figures, the number of test pilots who have died in this country since the beginning of our space program. These are the first astronauts to die in a direct uh, accident directly related to the space program. It should not be a cause for our turning back or having any question of, of faltering in our prog progress forward toward uh, the landing on the moon. We probably are going to be delayed. Uh, it may be possible to make up the time. It seems a little doubtful. Uh, we may be able to consolidate two flights, although we'd already consolidate a couple in the Saturn Apollo program. Uh, but it means maybe a couple of months delay. It could push us from late 68 to 69. It may push us from 69 to 70 if something else happens. Uh, but it, there's going to be a delay. But uh, certainly it shouldn't in any way uh, uh, damage our national resolve press on with the program for which these men gave their lives. Thank you, Walter. So, to sum up, America's first three Apollo astronauts were trapped and killed by a flash fire that swept their Apollo spacecraft early tonight in a launch pad test at Cape Kennedy. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and rookie astronaut Roger Chaffee training for his first space flight. A flight scheduled for February 21st, now postponed indefinitely. The three men aboard their spacecraft, 10 minutes from a simulated liftoff, when a flash fire hit at 6.31 tonight, Eastern Standard Time. They were in their spacesuits, buttoned up inside the spacecraft when the fire hit. There was a flash, and that was it. 
according to a NASA spokesman watching the television screen in the blockhouse just a few hundred yards from the launch pad. President Johnson tonight mourned the death of the three astronauts. He said that they gave their lives in the nation's service. This has been a special report from CBS News. Mike Wallace at the CBS Newsroom in New York. This has been the CBS News Special Report.